Good morning. Let's take a few deep breaths. Begin to center ourselves for the purpose of worship. I will start with the silent meditation, not so silent as I read it. This is from Desire of the Everlasting Hills, a marvelous book by Thomas Cahill that is now over 20 years old, I'm stunned to figure out. It is no use saying that we are born 2,000 years too late to give room to Christ. Nor will those who live at the end of the world have been born too late. Christ is always with us, always asking for room in our hearts. But now it is with the voice of our contemporaries that Christ speaks. With the eyes of store clerks, factory workers, and children that he gazes with the hands of office workers, slum dwellers, and suburban housewives that he gives. It is with the feet of soldiers and tramps that he walks, and with the heart of anyone in need that he longs for shelter. And giving shelter or food to anyone who asks for it or needs it is giving to Christ. Please rise now, whether in body or spirit, and join me in the call to worship. I am the Good Shepherd, says the Lord, the one, the one who tends us, who guides us to pasture, whose voice we recognize. I am the Good Shepherd, says the Lord, the one who bends to heal us, travels through the deepest valleys with us, who gives up everything for us all. I am the Good Shepherd, says the Lord, the one whose rod and staff comfort us, whose strength and love holds us, whose cup of love runneth over. I am the Good Shepherd, says the Lord, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us now worship God's people in God's love for God's word. Amen. Please be seated. And let us reflect on our common humanity. Again, and as it will be going forward, there are parts for you also. O oh God, you come to us with the strength of a loving Father, with the tender mercy, patience, and protection of a loving mother. Yet we often fail to turn to you, to praise you, to offer you our burdens. Instead, in these times of difficult separation and of isolation, we turn inward, allowing the free and freeing flow of your Spirit through us to be dammed up and to dry out. We become parched ground, dry twigs, empty water courses. Free us from inwardness. Free us from selfishness to recognize you, praise and serve you in our daily living, in the comings and goings of our simple and complicated living. We pray that your loving kindness to the world may be offered through our hands, our words, our actions, and our hearts. Open our eyes and our ears, that wherever we go, we may hear your voice calling us by name, calling us to serve, calling us to share, calling us to praise, so that we never give up on the promise of your kingdom, where the world is transformed and all can enjoy life in all its fullness. Amen. And now let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, your light shines within us. Do not let our doubt or darkness speak to us. Lord Jesus Christ, your light shines within us. Let our hearts always welcome your love. Let us now hear your word for us today. Amen. Our first 
reading follows immediately upon Peter's first sermon in Jerusalem, which we've been following for a couple of weeks. This is from the second chapter of Acts from the 42nd verse. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Good morning. I want you to dig back into your file cabinet, in your brain, and pick out the story that we all know so well of Jesus healing the blind man. And what I want you to remember is, is that at this particular time, the Pharisees and the Jewish people really did not believe in him. And so he was having a difficult time. And they brought him before them and this is, was his response to their questions of why did you do this on the Sabbath? Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the shape hold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and abandoned. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them out at his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger though, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of the stranger. Jesus uses this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus says to them, Very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in, and will go out, and will find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, to destroy. I come that they may have life, and have it abundantly. to God. So friends, I mentioned last week, among our many metaphors and characterizations of Jesus, the term Pantocrator, seen in many a mosaic in the ancient Near East and Europe, Jesus portrayed as the maker of all things. This is the all-powerful aspect of God, linked to wisdom. Another personification. This is God the Creator. God the Creator in our Bibles. You've heard me say that in the 8th chapter of Proverbs, we find wisdom present at creation. Helping God. Beyond being a wise man, Jesus is this personified wisdom. Many a theologian has found the eternal, cosmic, second person of the Trinity in that mysterious figure. Not just a wise man, but wisdom itself. 
It is through Jesus God created all things, and they are created good. In fact, they are created beautiful. God didn't create all of the creation or create us because God needed anything. God created out of an excess of joy and of love. And I will call those the great constants or laws, borrowing those phrases from physics, of God's universe. God loves all things. God loves us. The most poignant aspect of this is God's close walk with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the one that we will all walk again one day. God delights in that being together, and God delights in them. God gives love, and God seeks love in that activity. In order to give as great a love as possible, God gives us a great mutuality. God gives us the freedom to consent and the freedom to love, or sadly not to love. We are free to fail, to thrive, to fail to be at peace, to fail to be partners, to fail to love. And inevitably, as Augustine would tell us, we do fail. The good news is, God accounted for that. I owe these thoughts to Trevor Hudson, in his wonderful book, Beyond Loneliness, starting at the 35th page, like all the books that I mention, this is in my office, and you are welcome to borrow it at any time. During this time of loneliness, a pretty great read. When God came and sought out Adam and Eve after their failure, after they went and hid and covered themselves, God didn't come as the omnipotent thunderer or a vengeful, jealous jailer. God comes at what some theologians call the small God. This is the God who encountered Jacob. This is the God who appears in many places in our Bible as a person interacting with the characters, the persons of our Bible. Small God appears most powerfully in my own theology and that in some other books, as Jesus Christ, who is the life of our New Testament. God comes walking. God doesn't come shouting, come out, but asking, where are you? God sought them in order to repair their relationship, and God has done so ever since. In the 49th chapter of Genesis, the dying Jacob, a man who lived his whole life by his wits and by his wiles, and whose name actually translates as the Joker, this man blessed his son Joseph, last of all his sons, with words about his own blessing. This is um, 49 something, I can't remember, so I won't tell you. Because of the hand of the Mighty One of Jacob, because of the Shepherd, the Rock of Israel, because of the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the skies above, blessings of the deep springs below, blessings of the breast and womb, your Father's blessings are greater than the blessings of the ancient mountains, than the bounty of the age-old hills. God determined to find Jacob. God determines to find us, to seek us out despite every failure of character or of action. I know this in my own life. So may anyone. Jesus, our great shepherd, who precedes all things and made all things, who stands outside of time itself, enters our world again and always. Small God, to seek, redeem, and restore us. The Gospel of Luke tells a story, actually three stories, about things that are lost in the 15th chapter. You know this very well. There is a lost sheep, there is a lost coin, and there is or are a lost son or two lost sons, all in a row, from the greatest number to the least number. This story is also known, of course, as the prodigal son. Like Adam and Eve, the prodigal, 
and I say, and his brother, imagine life would be better, more satisfying, and more complete without the onerous weight of being in a mutual, loving relationship with a father, with God. So he or they, like Adam and Eve, smash up that loving, balanced, harmonious relationship in order to have more. More of what? How much more will be enough? And how much harm does that do to a heart that is designed for the love of God, to a heart and a person designed for relationship? Our life, like that of these sons, is conditioned by the failure of Eden, the failure of humanity to be human, to be humane. That is why Ellen T. Cherry, whom I had the pleasure of being a student under at seminary, wrote this in God and the Art of Happiness on page 30. Human life is purposeful. To become wise and filled by enjoying God as much as possible in this life is to achieve our purpose. Knowing that here we will never be completely safe from suffering and distress. Only those who know or have God to the fullest experience true spiritual joy. How much we give up by estranging ourselves from God. That love is native to us. We are created for it. To have the whole world and not have that love is at last to be empty. Empty of meaning and empty of hope. The good name, the good news, is that our good shepherd Jesus continues to love and call us. Asking, where are you? Could that be more gentle? That's an invitation. Come out. Let's talk. Come let us reason together. Yes, this is serious. No, it does not have to be fatal. Dr. Cherry insists on page 32, the only teacher, indeed the only wisdom, that can perfect us, that we cannot lose involuntarily, is God, whom we lose only by abandoning Him. Even though we abandon God, God does not abandon us. Instead, God comes after us striving to bring us back to the fold. This is from Isaiah, the 40th chapter, the 11th verse. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He gently leads those who have young. And some would have us believe that's it. That's the whole of our salvation. But is it? What happens when the prodigal comes in? What will happen if and when his brother comes in? They'll need to do the hard work of being reconciled to each other, of recreating harmony and balance and mutuality. They will need to love and to forgive, and to accept what has been, and then accept each other. The rebirth of love, thanks be to God, is another thing Jesus has a lot to say about, a lot to teach us about. Jesus is willing. We need only humble our hearts, giving up the need to be first, or most, or best, or only. Then comes the trick of the sheepfold. We picture in our minds being brought in to that safety and security, protected by the gatekeeper, Jesus, we can rest without fear. But the next day, Jesus, our good shepherd, is going to call us by name, and he's going to lead us out. Out where following him and trusting him is our safety. Out where imitating him and loving our neighbor is to be our daily food. We go out in order to grow into our full humanity, to become more and more in the image of God by behaving as God does. We go out as lambs. 
We go without providing for ourselves. We go out with one cloak and one pair of sandals to encourage others to use their power of choice to step into the same road that we've chosen. We're not the shepherd, and we are no longer thieves and robbers. We are the redeemed witnesses to eternal life with the eternal shepherd, who neither slumbers nor sleeps, but seeks out the lost and the lonely. With him we are in the work of renewing the earth by our example, the example of peace, of patience, of gentleness, of guilelessness, of stubborn, unending love. Friends, we have been inside a long while. It has worn on our patience, so we must find patience. It has worn on our nerves, so we must rediscover our nerve. It has worn on our trust, and we must find trust. It has worn on our love, and so we must reach still deeper for love. Sometime we will go out again. Our security, our purpose, and our passion then will be found in the ways and the love of our Good Shepherd. There are going to be people who will have lost more than we have. We need to help them. There will be people who can't find good or happiness or purpose in their lives. We need to love them and listen to them until they are whole. There will be people who have lost trust in God. We need to reconcile and restore them by Jesus' own example of loving kindness and goodwill. We can share with them that yes, terrible things happen to us and that life is fragile. But our Good Shepherd promises us terrible things are temporary. They do not have the last say. In the end, our Shepherd leads us to springs of life. He leads us again beside the waters, waters that are fountains of life in the city of God, where every tear is dry. We will need to lean on each other to do these things, not counting the time, not losing patience, not losing hope, but loving as we have been designed to love and as we have been loved. Thanks be to God, we have our Good Shepherd to go before us. Amen. Will you now stand as you are able and join me in our affirmation of faith, which will be the same on this Sunday every year as long as I am here. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. And please be seated. And we will come to our time of concerns and joys. For Dustin Driver in New Zealand. For Dustin Driver in New Zealand. I have a feeling I know the connection, but <laughs> for Dustin it is. And I want you to know, friends, you have phone numbers there. I am in the for at least an hour after service. If you want to call me or text me there, please feel free to do so. And now let us pray. This is by Rev. Abi. It is old. It is from the Vicar of Wadley Blaubspot, which is no longer maintained. O Lord, our shepherding God, come close to us now. Come near us in our time of need. Shepherding God, we need you in our time of anxiety. We need you in our time of economic uncertainty. We need you in a time of a globe-trotting disease. We need you to bind our wounds. 
and pour your healing ointment on our heads. We need the briars and brambles and burrs pulled out of our fleece and skin. Shepherd and God, you guide us with your voice. Help us to listen and follow, no matter where your voice leads. Help us to trust you. Shepherd and God, protect us from the hired hands that do not really care for us and have neglected or abused us in the past. Shepherd in God, thank you for your Son who laid down his life for those who follow him and for those who are not in the fold yet. Lord, we pray for those who don't know the Shepherd, whose life circumstances kept them from knowing the Good Shepherd. We pray that by our actions, our behavior, and our reaching out into the community, that they may come to know you. Shepherd in God, renew us. Guide us with your love and renew us with your peace. And now let us pray the prayer that our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, the shepherd cares for us, providing all we need in abundance. The shepherd calls to love one another in truth and action. Now may our gifts reflect our trust in the shepherd's care. May our offering show our willingness to love one another. God of love, you abide with us. You provide for all our needs and guide us in all our ways. Out of gratitude, we bring our gifts before you. Use them for your work of caring, that all may feast at the table of abundance, walk without fear, and drink deeply from the cup of compassion. Amen. You have a part to play in the charge, so please, again, rise or not, in spirit or in body, as you wish, and join me in this part of the charge. The Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want. In pastures green we rest secure. Our shepherd leads us forth. By still waters we rest secure. Our shepherd brings us abundant life. And friends, now may the love of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight. That is the 20th verse of 13th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And now, friends, I commend you to God and to the message of God's grace a message that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance with all who are sanctified. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and every day. God, Joe, God,